Last year, in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, consciousness came of age. The University of Arizona hosted a conference called Towards a Science of Consciousness. It brought together over a thousand people from 32 countries. Neurologists, psychologists, physicists, philosophers, enough to fill six lecture halls for five days. The passionate discussions carried right through to the closing banquet. Even though consciousness is, for the first time, a serious scientific pursuit, it's still the philosophers who rule. Many of them can't even agree on a definition of consciousness. Daniel Dennett takes the simple view. There are lots of very seductive tricks of the imagination which convince people that consciousness is a more wonderful phenomenon than it actually is. So I have to rely on particularly experiments with very counterintuitive results which sort of shock people into realizing, gee, I guess I wasn't conscious of quite as much as I thought I was. One of those experiments is called the Marilyn Monroe Room. Imagine walking into a room covered with identical images like Andy Warhol's Marilyn. You say, oh my gosh, uh, all these wonderful pictures of Marilyn Monroe. Uh, but of course, you can't actually see all that in a glance. You can't identify a face as the face of anybody without the fovea of your eye, the center high resolution part of your eye actually coming to rest on it. It's because of the way the eye darts around that we have this sense that we're taking it all in our heads. We're not. We're taking in a very limited portion of what's in the head and the sense that it's all in here is an illusion. And to prove the point, if you'll look closely, you'll see that not all the images in this virtual room are of Marilyn Monroe. I'm taking really a very conservative line. I'm saying that consciousness is an extraordinary set of phenomena, but they can all be explained by what we might call normal science. And moreover, I say that people have a, an inflated idea of what consciousness is. Here's the problem is easy and hard. But many of Daniel Dennett's colleagues think his explanations are too easy. A lot of them are now concerned with what they call the hard problem. How does the brain produce, from mere cells, the beauty of a desert sunset. This subjective side of consciousness can be illustrated by a thought experiment well known to philosophers. Imagine Mary, a 23rd century neuroscientist whose field of expertise is color vision. She knows everything there is to know about how the brain processes color, but she only sees in black and white. So all of her knowledge about the color spectrum physiology of the eye is academic. Now there's something left out of her account and something left out of any description of the world in purely third person terms, namely what it feels like, what it feels like to see something red. One day Mary is released from her black and white world and given the ability to see red for the first time, to experience it consciously. Surely her first experience of color would be something she couldn't have anticipated even with all her previous knowledge. This thought experiment suggests there will always be more to consciousness than objective observation. Now this is the essence of consciousness. For any conscious state, there is the question, what's it feel like to be in that state? What's it like? What is the qualitative character of it? Now that's so hard for us to accept, but it's obviously true. See, our scientific tradition up to this point has tended to resist that because we think, well, no, there ought to be some neutral third-person description. And of course, there are third-person descriptions of consciousness, but the essential thing about consciousness itself, the actual essence, is there's always something it feels like to be in a conscious state. If you have any doubts about that, just pinch yourself or scratch your head or hit yourself on the knee and you will discover the existence of a qualitative state. That's the guts of consciousness. The question, what is consciousness, ranks right up there in complexity with what is life. Even with the growing amount of scientific investigation, there's not really much we know for sure. But I know one thing. The more I find out about this, the greater my sense of wonder about my inner world and its place in the universe. Some of the really big questions, the classic one is, why is a rose beautiful, for example? 
Um, I don't know that we'll ever necessarily figure that out. And, you know, sometimes we, we scientists get very arrogant. We sometimes think we know it all or we can figure out everything and that we've got the tools that can unlock all the mysteries of the universe. Well, maybe sometimes, and maybe not. If we wouldn't know about consciousness, if we wouldn't have this first-person account of consciousness, we would never believe it. But we do. We all do. At least most of us say we do. And so therefore, we need to explain it. The answer to this question, what is consciousness, is the, is the answer to the question, what sort of beings are we? And it's the different definitions of ourselves that's at stake when we try to get a theory of consciousness.